first story is Snowbird by Ali Bacon. Ali is from Emerson's Green in South Gloucestershire and writes contemporary and historical fiction. She has been listed for several short story awards and recently won the 2019 Bristol Short Story Local Writer Prize. Having acted as my co-judge for three previous events, she says she knows how tough the competition is, making it all the more gratifying for her to make a fourth appearance as a leader tonight. So, please welcome to the stage to read Snowbird, Callie Bacon. The heat clutches of my throat, bringing back that itch of doubt. If I'd wanted to be a snowbird, I could have done it years ago with Daniel. But after our trip to Africa, we stuck to Europe or the eastern seaboard. One hot season had been enough. But hell, those Iowa winters sure get to my bones. So when Annie asked me to join her and Ezra on their trip, I let myself be persuaded. I guess my daughter needed my company. That husband of hers is good-natured enough, but not a lot of fun. Annie is artistic, impulsive. How does she put up with his comfortable dreariness? At the plantation resort, I stole things in my cabin, dripping noise unidentified, bathroom sink, something out of doors, and go to join them in the open air bar. Ezra's alone. How are you doing, Celia? The Celia is fine. I never wanted anyone but Annie to call me mom. Hitched awkwardly on the bar stool, I manage a smile. I guess you and I were dragged here against our better judgment. His eyes crinkle. From this, I divine amusement or agreement or both. Ezra is not a talker. I can work anywhere, he says. Annie wanted a break. When she appears, we all agree the cabins are pretty and the humidity will diminish. January is the dry season. Then all night, rain falls like gunshot on the tin roof, and I lie awake, thinking of Africa. Getting off that plane, I sucked up the humid breath of the Congo, thirsty for more. Our village was makeshift, erected for the project. A jeep went in the town every couple of days to pick up food. We drew water from the sullen river, dropped in purifying tablets and hoped for the best. The heat and the wildness of everything turned us on. Daniel and I were crazy for it, jumping each other in the forest, going back to lick and scratch each other in the secret confines of a hut. I imagined our private parts glowed red like the baboons. <laughs> Here in the Caribbean, everything around us drips and steams. Next morning, Ezra stays by the pool with his laptop because the signal's good up there. Annie and I take a tour with one of the resort guides. When he offers to show us the cocoa sheds on the terrace, I leave them and watch from a distance. I see how his teeth flash and how she leans on his arm when he makes her walk barefoot through the trees of cocoa beans. Then he jumps in the bean pot and whirls his hips in that show off for tourists dance so everything turns hazy. And I blink to clear my head of ghosts. Back at the pool, Ezra's fingers are scouring the keyboard. I want to shake him. 
Wake up. Look after your wife. Down here, night falls like a shutter. The light in the cabin is too dim to read. There's only rain and the creaking chirp of the tree frogs. I listen for rustlings under my hut. In all the years since Daniel's been gone, it's the first time I've been afraid of the dark. At breakfast, Ezra shoes away the dun-coloured dun birds that swoop and dive around our table. <coughs> Annie asks him to walk up to where the torch lilies grow. Her smile is pleading. It's the best place for hummingbirds. He makes a sad face. I have a Skype call at 11. Annie shrugs. OK, maybe later. All work and no play. That's Ezra for you. My thoughts drift back to the Congo. After two weeks, I stepped on a loose stone in the river, wrenched my ankle and collapsed onto a jagged rock that left me sore and scarred. I became the project invalid. Team members called with what passed for gossip. Daniel got wrapped up in the work we'd come there to do. Sex, even cautious, tender sex, diminished and disappeared. I wanted to be with the others, observing and recording, not lying there watching spiders drift between the doorposts. Daniel took off on a two-day trek with Martha, the project leader, to look at some species sighted further west. I wondered how and where they would make their beds. Would one surprise the other under the mosquito net? Between halting trips to the latrine, I lay in a permanent lassitude, craving Pepsi, blackcurrant milkshake, anything other than coconut milk. When my reading ran out, I was rehydrated by fantasies. Daniel dragging me back to the jungle in the heat of the day. <clears throat> Daniel having fever of sex with Martha while I looked on, getting up a sweat of my own. Through the door of the hut, I watched the local boys who'd been hired to cook and run errands, seeing for the first time the curve and the nape of the neck the flash of white-soled feet. One of them brought me maniac twice a day, avoiding my eyes as he laid the food next to my bed. I caught him looking back at me as he left. I guess he had a nose for pheromones. One still night with the air cooling faster than the land and the river frogs chanting a chorus, he turned his eyes on me and I turned back the sheet to let him in. When Daniel came back to the camp, he took one look at me and said, you're sick, you should go home. I'm not <coughs> sick, I just can't walk. No, you have a fever, he said, anyone can see. He wiped my forehead with a towel wrung out in water, and I raised my limbs for him to bathe, noticing for the first time how hard it was to lift them from the bed. He took my temperature. You have an infection. I'll get you some penicillin. As my fever abated, Martha called to sympathise. I glimpsed her son toughen cleavage as she leaned in for a kiss. A straight-laced scientist with flaky lips. What had I been thinking? I listened to the camp boys play soccer in the dirt outside. None of them looked my way. I've been full on hallucinating. The penicillin gave me the runs and I felt sick for sure and got myself shipped back home, leaving behind the memory of how it had felt, how he had felt, the African boy in my bed. Once Daniel was home, we rarely talked about Africa. A two-week trip, a road not taken. Annie, 
conceived in a jungle fever, popped out as pale as a Norwegian sky. Only as she grew older, I began to see another child skipping beside her, a black boy with a familiar profile, a lost twin, an alternate reality. Next afternoon, I stumble on Ed and Annie coming back from a walk. He went with her after all. Annie's fair skin is all paint up. It was great. We saw three hummingbirds. We should go again tomorrow, all of us. Her legs are still white below her skimpy shorts. Ezra's stubby brown calves taper into heavy soled sandals. Chalk and cheese. But sometimes that can work. Maybe Daniel and I were too alike. In the evening, they're making plans. A hike to a neighbouring plantation. A boat trip in search of whales. What would you like to do, Mum? Annie asks. A bird flits through the darkening cocoa trees. Is there someone lurking out there? Ezra refills my rum punch from the picture. Celia? He's talking to me, but his eyes, like mine, are on Annie. There's no one outside. The ghost of the black boy has melted away. The only intruder is me. Well, thank you for asking, but this heat is just too much for me. I'm going to book an early flight home. I must be missing the snow.